best movie ever. Also, a perfect analogy for global change and the Anthropocene. And that's the topic of my brief talk to you tonight. So the Earth system is a suite of interacting physical, chemical, and biological global scale cycles and energy fluxes that describe the planet. And the way to think about it is they're like Darth Vader's helmet. So they're our life support system on the planet. And as an ecologist, I like plants and animals and bees, but I had neglected to consider that there is a big massive socio-economic component to global change and that we need to think about these biophysical support systems that keep Darth Vader and us alive but the socio-economic ones as well. So the Anthropocene is a concept that's been recently developed uh, in the last 10-15 years and it's the current geological epoch with human activity as the dominant force shaping climate and cycles on the planet. Huge idea. And what this concept is proposing is that we're living in a no analog state, planetary, terra incognito, uh, an unprecedented and unsustainable system. So the way to think about that is like the Death Star, right? So we've made a planet that requires maintenance and input from us at all times. And there has been debate on whether the Anthropocene is early or recent. So the advantage and disadvantage of the conceptualization of the, the extent that we've changed the planet is that the longer view gradualizes this idea of change and the more recent view proposes, wow, we've made big changes very rapidly. And here are the three phases of change on the planet or our construction of the Death Star, right? Uh, stage one is the industrial era, and so I thought of that just as like the technology that lets us make things. But it was also a change in culture to support risk and innovation to really develop a different way to live on the planet. The first phase is best described by CO2 emissions, so things that we put up in the atmosphere. All the models, except maybe one, predict that we're putting and going to continue to put a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, and this changes how the planet functions. And atmospheric CO2, a change from 200 to 400 is massive, and we were at 200 a long time ago, now we're at 400, and even little tremors in the force of 5 to 20 make a big difference in climate and how the planet functions. Phase two of the Anthropocene, this is kind of a horror story, but really it's a message of hope, a new hope, uh, is right that these innovations caused a whole bunch of changes that are happening really rapidly in how we live on the planet and how we interact with the planet. And this figure shows a whole bunch of things and they're all J-shaped. They're changing really rapidly, right? And one of the plots is even number of McDonald's, which is my favorite one. The number of McDonald's and fast food restaurants are exploding and this is an indication of changes that maybe we don't necessarily want to see in the planet but that are happening very rapidly given this phase. That data, uh, those data I showed you are from about 10 years ago. Here's the most recent ones from 2015. 2016 is the year that we decide whether we believe in the Anthropocene or not. So 36 global wiener scientists, including geologists, ecologists, are debating whether we need to believe in this term or not, and the evidence is looking pretty good. That there have been a lot of changes in Darth Vader's helmet, how we live on the planet, and a lot of changes in the socioeconomics of the systems that we use to support the planet. So we're seeing some of the greatest aggregations of wealth, but also some of the greatest rates of poverty and some of the greatest rates of development. So if in 2016, globally, this panel of scientists decides this is a really big, important concept we need to think about, the implication is stage three. We've made a system now that we need to manage. So the nice way to think about it is that we are stewards of the Earth. And there are you know, this is kind of a big implication, and this is one of the most profound implications that if we're going to manage this system, we're not going to be managing it just for a little while. We're going to have big impacts that are lagged maybe for millions of years. So humans, depending on who you talk to, have maybe only been around for 160,000 160, years, but our impacts are going to be felt for millions of years. 
So the three models that we can think about as stewards in terms of how we want to manage the planet are one, business as usual, money, that's okay, right? We can do carbon credits, we can induce, introduce incentives for positive behavior and we can try to align green initiatives with profits, all fine. That's the easiest model in many respects because it's the one that got us where we are now. Two big assumptions though, right? That health isn't going to be impacted with running this model, that we're still going to have clean air and water to breathe. And secondly, that the wealth and the adaptability in the systems are going to be present. So if the market says we need to change, we actually need to be able to change it. The second model is the R2D2 model that you're going to intervene and mitigate some of these changes. So we're not just going to let the business's usual model and the market sort it all out. We need to intervene and make some changes. The third way that we can be stewards of the earth, which is the one that is probably the most tempting but the scariest, is the geoengineering one. We're saying, uh-oh, the planet's cooling off. Let's blow a whole bunch of aerosols up into the soil and we'll deflect the sunlight away and then we'll live in the land of the matrix. But there's all these indirect effects that we haven't thought about. So the new synthesis in global change as an ecologist includes both these earth systems that support us and the social, both, not just one, and that we need to think about these safe operating spaces, not just for us, but for really long time scales. That's it, thanks.